Uh, good afternoon, Fadas and Sororas. Good morning, I guess, uh, a little bit for some folks. And I guess good evening, perhaps, for some others, but uh, welcome. I'm just delighted to be able to be here. I'm going to do a little bit of something here. Uh, in a moment, I'm going to uh, do a screen share where just to kind of go through this presentation. Uh, I want to I'll just acknowledge and, and uh, uh, and recognize the, the wonderful presentation that our Graham Mass had just provided us, which provides a, a, a great background to uh, this presentation. And, uh, and I think what is particularly interesting at this time in, in following her, her presentation is that with, like with much that we know over the Rosicrucian teachings, eventually science begins to catch up. Right, generally you know, dubious, skeptical, doesn't believe you know, that these things could be possible because of the very often materialistic view of the world that uh, modern science has. Uh, and so uh, like what the Grand Master related to her personal mystical experiences, as well as you know, her reflections on, on writings of others and, and thoughts, uh, we are now beginning to see really over the last 20 years of research since the 90s, uh, perhaps late 90s. Uh, and actually you'll see something that predate that as well, but uh, that research coming out of the, the laboratories of, of a modern scientists, uh, bringing what are empirical support and evidence uh, of what was really related by our grandmaster. So that's what we're gonna talk about uh, through this presentation. Uh, as uh, for those of us who like an extra dose of science with our mystical studies, uh, they you will know, find this likely especially satisfying. Some people, you know, uh, I'm going to say uh, don't require that or don't, uh, you know, it's not necessarily, uh, they'd rather perhaps draw something or, you know, or look at some, you know, uh, beautiful piece of art. Uh, but for those who have a scientific bent, everything that I'm going to present in this presentation all have empirical scientific laboratory evidence to support every one of these uh, uh, things that I'm going to share. So uh, much of it is still controversial to the more orthodox uh, individuals in the scientific field uh, that just very often have been saddled with a notion of, of intelligence and where it comes from and very often. Uh, so uh, I said, so there's still controversy uh, around these things, but largely because of the very fixed notions that you know, the kind of materialistic scientists bring to these things and the difficulty of accepting things that are outside of the realm of what has been traditionally been accepted. And, and uh, we've seen that in other areas of physics, quantum mechanics, all these type of things, and uh, that have uh, challenged accepted uh, notions of wisdom. So. Anyway, I'm going to now share uh, the screen uh, with you and uh, uh, take you through uh, some of this. And I think, uh, let's, let's see how this goes. No, that's not one. Oh. So, Fred and Soros, uh, <clears throat> the, the title of, of this presentation is The Universal Intelligence in the Plant Kingdom. And it really is just drawing on Grandmaster Julie's uh, pointing out to us that there's this intelligence, it's throughout nature, it's throughout creation, and it also manifests in some amazingly similar ways in the plant kingdom as it does in the other forms of life that we know on the planet. And that's really kind of what we're going to talk about. Uh, <clears throat> so we have a, oh, sorry about that, uh, universal intelligence. So and the underlying idea here is that there is one universal intelligence. And I think uh, we might call it the cosmic consciousness. We know from our earliest Rosicrucian uh, monographs that uh, you know, the, these, uh, we're all connected through this one intelligence and a variety of things are able to take place because of that in terms of communication among uh, you know, tele telepathic communication, other ways of communicating and attuning because there is one intelligence, which is this cosmic consciousness. And this same consciousness is throughout all of creation is what uh, is the assertion here. 
So all living things manifest the same universal intelligence. And when you look at plants, as is noted here, uh, the intelligence is directed toward the objectives, uh, uh, the same objectives as the intelligence we see in other animals. So self-preservation, seeking nutrients, reproduction, and avoiding irritation, kind of a bit of a science-oriented term that says you're not, you want to avoid pain and discomfort, right? So you know, parts of our behaviors as human beings are to avoid those things. Now, this does not necessarily mean these are the only things that that intelligence in plants is directed towards. Uh, just as like, these are not the only things that human, uh, the human expression of intelligence is directed toward, but we can see uh, these similarities in the plant kingdom. Uh, and I think when you, uh, you know, again, drawing on, on the Grand Master's presentation, uh, illustrations in there of other things that are clearly going on with this intelligence as it simply has the form of plant life, right? And that one can tap into those things and perhaps get wisdom from those things and other uh, directions and so on. So uh, if we go to say, what is intelligence? And this is kind of the, uh, the scientific community uh, has its definition, and we're going to use that for the purposes of this. Uh, so one is the ability to sense uh, one's environment. Uh, a second is to be able to process and integrate sensory information. So, okay, there's being able to sense the environment, but then it's to take this in and to process that information. Then to decide on how to act. And lastly, the ability to solve problems. And, and uh, if you've kind of read much, or you, we all see around us this uh, information in the news and other media about artificial intelligence, this is kind of the definition that uh, artificial intelligence uh, works by. All right, there's information using sensors. It could be you know, in the self-driving uh, Tesla, it's using sensors to pick up information in the environment, generally using cameras and light, radar and, and lasers, et cetera. Uh, there's a central processing unit, a computer, CPU, that is taking that central information uh, and integrating it. There's some programming, right, a built in that says if you see an object and it's about this big and it's this far away, the car should, you know, deaccelerate, right, uh, uh, you know, or stop, whatever the case may be. And that uh, if there's a need to work around something, uh, so there's a, a you know, a detour where also uh, one is able to then process that and say, oh, can't go this way, let's go this other way. So ability to sense the environment, process and integrate sensory information, decide on how to act and ability to solve problems. I want to say these really, in a sense, the last three items, the first items generally have been people, uh, you know, science for a long time has accepted plants and other living things are able to sense their environment, right? They react to their environments but this notion of processing uh, sensory information and deciding particularly. So that's when we kind of get into this, where it's not just quote unquote instinct or a chemical reaction, but deciding how to act uh, as a tool to solve problems, right? To attain its objectives, which we were talking about before, some very basic objectives of you know, self-preservation, uh, seeking nutrients, uh, reproduction, and avoiding of irritation. Uh, so these things are kind of central to what is described as intelligence. And we're going to see how plants do these exact same things. They decide how to act. They have the ability to solve problems, which is where the contentious discussion still exists in parts of the scientific community. But the evidence is very hard to explain away that, uh, that shows this is true. So let's look at some characteristics of plants. One, there's a term, plants are sessile, or they, are, live, they stay in a fixed location, right? So plants aren't walking across the room, uh, they're kind of planted, which makes for some special challenges, right? If you're trying to survive, right? We have a danger, we run from it, right? We're gonna move ourselves away from a danger. Plants can't generally do that, right? Only in very limited ways at most can they do that. So they've got a fixed location, which means they're greater challenges in order to survive. Uh, but plants do move. And this is a, you know, kind of a very good or uh, very interesting concept. Uh, it's really just a rethinking of, of, in some ways, the obvious, right? We think, we know plants grow, but we don't think about it. That's their way of moving. They can't get up and relocate, but they can actually move through growing towards something that's a value or move 
uh, to grow away from something that's an irritant, right? So they do move, but they do it through growth. Uh, not surprisingly, they act on a much slower time scale uh, than other animals. Uh, because if we kind of look at it ourselves, uh, if you're standing, you know, looking at a blade of grass, it's, uh, you can be sitting there for the whole afternoon, perhaps. Well, maybe not on a, after a rainy day, but generally speaking, you're not going to see it grow. But if you come back a day later or two days later, you've noticed that the plant, that the, the grass has grown. So it acts on a much slower time scale than, than humans do. And that uh, uh, can somewhat be misleading to us because of this, uh, this difference in time scale. And they have functions akin to the human senses that are very much like the human senses. Uh, so uh, you know, we, will, we will kind of explore that. Uh, in addition, by the way, they have other things beyond just the human senses, right? So we're gonna talk about that. They actually employ very sophisticated methods of self-defense. Right? They have to survive. So this is again what we see with living things, where we see them with the smallest, you know, insects, I've had my recent battles with ants, and I'm like amazed at how, you know, they're smart. Sort of, you know, spiders really smart, right? They were like, oh, coming after me, you know, I'm behind this corner. Let me get back under here. They kind of figured it out. Plants actually uh, have to, because they can't run, right? Can't run, can't hide. They too, though, have very sophisticated kind of uh, uh, types of uh, self-defense. Some of those additional characteristics of plants, they communicate with other plants. These are all characteristics of plants. They communicate with other plants, and that was spoken about earlier. They have memory. Uh, yep, they kind of remember. Uh, and uh, we'll kind of go in to illustrate that, uh, you know, laboratory experiments that demonstrate plants have memory. Uh, they exhibit purposeful decision-making. Like, nope, need to go left, not right, because uh, left is better for me than right. They do that. They can distinguish self from non-self, right? So uh, you know, one of the things I look at in higher consciousness or evidence of higher consciousness in animals generally is being able to, to actually identify self. Well, uh, you know, that's the test of kind of, how, does an animal recognize itself in the mirror? And we see a number of creatures do that. They'll put a little paint dot right in, in the animal's head and see if it recognizes, oh, that's me with the spot on my head. Uh, another kind of aspect of this is recognizing self from non-self, right? So uh, something is not them as compared to just being the plant. Uh, they reproduce through various uh, third party means of seed and pollen dissemination. Uh, there's the wind that blows pollen around. I'm actually feeling some of that today. Uh, there are insects who, you know, bees, the uh, lovely little bees and other pollinators that kind of uh, show up to, to do those things. And then there's animals who eat the fruit and deposit the seeds other places among other ways that they reproduce. Now plants bodies, let's look at plant bodies because plants, body, plants bodies are not like our bodies. Plants don't have organs. So this is one very significant difference. This is one of the things that confuses scientists uh, leads to a lot of the resistance because they don't, have, they don't have a brain. There's no like, oh, here's the plant's brain. Plants bodies, uh, uh, you know, are modular, right? So kind of in a sense, like everything is in every piece. Uh, so they don't have a plant brain, they don't have a liver, they don't have a stomach, right, which, which what animals typically do right, in some fashion, right? So their bodies are quite different. So they're modular as compared to being kind of uh, distributed, you know, there's different organs throughout a body. Uh, here's something special about plants. Plants must tolerate being eaten, right? You know, if we're eaten, we're kind of done, right? You know, you can't take much eating. Uh, plants have to you know, tolerate being eaten because they can't run. <laughs> it's, a, it's a difficult life in that way. So uh, interesting fact about plants, though, and some of you maybe who have got the green flum and, you know, thumb and do gardening, that plant root tips are kind of the key sensing and processing elements on plants, even more so than the leaves. The leaves have a function, too, in this way, but the root tips uh, and believe it or not, plants can have, a single plant can have millions of root tips. They're very, very tiny, minute things. They can have millions of these root tips in the soil. So just kind of look at the plant, plant senses, you know, just like us, they have senses. And uh, let's talk about one of the most obvious is their sense of sight. So, okay, well, what sense, what sense of sight? Uh, basically, sight means being responsive to, to light, right? If you... 
you may have bad sight or good sight or sharp sight or not so blurry sight, right? But it means that you can recognize a certain wavelengths of electromagnetic energy that we call light uh, that you can respond to that. Well, plants quite evidently do this, right? Plants, shoots grow toward a source of light, right? So we know they will bend toward the light, they'll grow toward that light. So clearly they can sense these vibrations, these frequency of vibrations, electromagnetic radiation, and then uh, grow to it. So that our, our actions or activities are not terribly different in the sense that basically even what we're recognizing as light is simply because there's little photons hitting our retina and it stimulates uh, rods and cones, which are cells in the back of the retina, which then send electrical signals along the optic nerve to the brain and we see a picture. So you don't really need an eyeball because the reality is our whole picture really is formed through some uh, basic electrical signals that wind up in our brain. So plants that grow toward a source of light, roots grow away from sources of light. So they actually go the other way, uh, no matter how you plant them. Uh, they differentiate between different parts of the light spectrum. That's quite interesting to avoid shade or to time behaviors. So plants have the ability to kind of, they can sense what time of day it is by, uh, is one of the ways, is by the spectrum of light that is most prominent. And we know, for instance, at sunset, right, the light is redder, right? And, you know, when you get other parts of the thing, if they're kind of deep in a forest, uh, the, sh the light is more towards blue. So plants actually adjust their behavior by uh, looking at this information, taking this information, responding to lots of laboratory tests that show how plants uh, respond to this. So I say again, everything that is here, there's plenty of lab experiments that demonstrate conclusively the, these kind of features of plants and these capabilities. Uh, interesting, clinging plants can somehow see, because if we're gonna talk about see, sight, but seeing, perceive viable objects uh, in their environment. And uh, we're gonna take a little bit of a YouTube detour here. I wanna say all the videos that you'll see here can be found on YouTube. So uh, they're all there. So what we have here is an example of a plant kind of perceiving, you're gonna see this very short video, uh, perceiving its environment uh, and uh, basically reacting or acting uh, based on that. If I can get, oh, that didn't work right. Here we go, let me try myself again here. Let's say this worked yesterday. Okay, there we go. Are we ready? Yes. Oh, sorry. We're gonna start over here. Here we go. This tree can see. To approach the support. So uh, you can see there's, you know, it's a laboratory experiment, obviously, <laughs> that you've got a plant and a, a little uh, pulled over in the side. Uh, looking at how uh, these plant, this particular plant, looks out to grow out to find a support uh, in its environment. And, you know, quite reasonably say, well, how does it do that, right? Uh, so that's uh, pretty amazing. Uh, but we'll come back to that a little bit more further as we go along here. So uh, plants are smart, smarter than we've been giving them credit for. Uh, so Let's look at smell. So what is smell? But basically smell is responding to chemical signals emitted uh, by largely other plants. Undoubtedly they respond to other chemical signals, pollutants, et cetera, too, because we can see that. Uh, so, you know, smell is really, we're saying when we're humans, as we're smelling something, right? We're reacting to a chemical in the air, right? That the molecules of that chemical hit, you know, our olfactory senses in our nose, and then the brain converts and we say, mm, that has a certain odor, right? So. Uh, plants also uh, can uh, respond to odors or, or chemicals in the air and therefore have the faculty of smelling uh, quite reliably. Uh, specific chemicals uh, uh, dependent on the threat. So uh, they are able to distinguish uh, different chemicals and those which represent a threat, those that, that don't, and they actually emit chemicals based on the nature of the threat as well. So they're very much that way. Uh, what one of the great ironies I find uh, in this, after all, is that the smell of fresh cut grass is really a signal to other plants that like uh, Armageddon is happening uh, and there are people going through doing terrible, terrible, terrible things to uh, their plant neighbors, uh, the, the grass. 
So that wonderful smell, you go, ah, it smells so good. No, that's plants basically putting out uh, chemical ethylene and some other things going. And this chemical, by the way, uh, ethylene is part of what goes out. That is used to be used as an anesthetic very early on. And, you know, the first uses of anesthesia, ethylene was an anesthetic used for humans. So there is a question and people are trying to further the research to see if it is serving a similar function in plants as in a something to basically uh, protect against pain, right? To mediate the perception of pain. So, you know, the smell of fresh cut grass, uh, we have to feel a little differently about it perhaps, uh, you know, as we think about it. So uh, plants also have the ability to touch. So right now we've shown they can see, they can smell, they respond to chemicals, they send out chemicals, uh, and uh, they, they respond to touch. So, uh, and touch really is physical contact with an object, right? That's what kind of, if you take the definition of touch is physical contact with an object. Uh, and uh, one of the best known plants of this is this mimosa, I'm gonna say pudica, I did not check my Latin on it. I saw someone referring to their Latin, hopefully they did better in Latin. Uh, uh, but uh, anyway, mimosa pudica, something like that. Uh, it's the mimosa plant basically. Uh, and if you will see in a moment or two how uh, we see it responds to that. Another plant that clearly shows that plants respond to touch, Venus flytrap, right? That's how to get eaten if you're an insect, right? Because it's responding to you walking, you know, in its midst, right? So it knows you're there from touch. Uh, clinging vines. So uh, what's interesting about clinging vines, they're kind of exhibiting a variety of competencies, uh, capabilities through this. They discern what is a good surface to wrap around, which is the thing, uh, well, you saw happening in that little lab thing of the little vine. Now, that was a time-lapse photograph, obviously. It wasn't like you know, normal human time. It was normal plant time. So then they were like, this is not time lapse, this is just plant time. To us, it seems like, like it's too slow to proceed. Uh, but uh, others look for good surfaces on tree trunks. So depending on, the, so some wrap around things, right? Uh, and others will look on tree trunks of how to climb because they're trying to get access to light. Uh, and since the tree has already kind of got itself up in the canopy, as compared to being on the ground, where most light is blocked off by basically they're in shade because of all the other trees and other things don't get as much natural light. Uh, they look, how do we get up to light? And they will uh, climb on, on trees to do that. Uh, so we're going to take a look at, here's, this is the mimosa, uh, and let me see if, uh, sorry, kind of, uh, have to, here we go. Okay. So here's a little thing on mimosa. Well, no, that didn't work quite right. I'm gonna do it for you again. So sometimes get up here. Where is that? Oh, okay, that's all right. Here we go. Doesn't like to be touched. Now, uh, undoubtedly, some plants perhaps do like to be touched, but not, not as, you know, maybe they like to be talked to or sang to, but to touching seems to be not to be a high point. Now, here's one. Uh, we're all kind of, I don't know, like they're all fascinated by Venus flytraps, right? Uh, so you're going to see an interesting demonstration here. Uh, sorry, I have to do everything twice, it looks like, to get it right here. Come on, let's try it again. This is a, a beetle with a bad afternoon. So determined, looking to try and get some food or something. And then you become food. It is rough out there. <laughs> we thought we had it bad as humans. <laughs> sort of, you know. Uh, so anyway, that's the Venus flytrap, uh, but here, now this one, by the way, we've invited a special guest to be part of this presentation. Uh, she was available, wasn't sure if we could get her, but uh, we were very happy to be able to get her, be part of our presentation. And let's see if it works right. Very 
high unless they can hold on tight. Like fingertips searching for a hold, this ivy is a piece of pads grip the bark. Some creepers use sharp claws to grapple onto the steep tree face. A cat's claw creeper hooks its tendrils into the tiniest crevices and hauls itself to the top. So uh, we saw that uh, that was Oprah who did a cameo, uh, didn't pay her. Uh, so, uh, let's look on to, so we've kind of went, again, sight, uh, smell, touch, and now we look at taste. Uh, so, uh, basically, uh, plants are able to distinguish between the saliva of various insects. Uh, and that can, you could imagine be very important because some insects may be, uh, more danger to them than others. Uh, Venus flytraps, though, demonstrate a really interesting ability to taste. Uh, because they can discern what is not food. So if you kind of put something goes in there that really is not digestible, right? The fly trap, the plant will reopen uh, that little uh, thing there in about 12 hours. But if the thing is edible, it will keep closed and, and ultimately digest it. So there's a response to uh, taste, but this saliva of various insects is another example of that. So plants, interesting enough, also can hear. So really, right now we got four out of the five human, uh, you know, kind of well-known uh, human uh, senses. So plants can hear. They will respond to a recording of the sounds of a caterpillar eating a leaf. So basically, uh, what scientists did is they kind of recorded uh, the sound of a caterpillar eating a corn plant's leaf. Right? They recorded that sound, and then they went and played it. They played it for a, a plant not with a caterpillar being eating it right now, but playing it as that sound, and the plant put out the same chemical mechanisms to defend itself, protect itself, as if it was being eaten when it heard the sound again. So that's where you see the plants also have memory. So they have hearing and memory. Uh, other features of their, of their hearing you can see is that plants will respond to the sound of water flowing through pipes by wrapping themselves around a pipe. And I guess some people who were plumbers and gardeners, you know, if you've got these things, they'll find where plants will actually go toward water mains and other water pipes that are underground, uh, wrapping themselves around it, thinking it would be a source of water, apparently. At least that's what's supposed, is what they presume the plant is thinking. Uh, plants also appear to communicate through some type of mechanical clicking sound at the root level. Uh, they're not sure, scientists haven't figured out exactly what's going on with it, but they see what seems to be some type of communication at the root level uh, there as well. So we've talked about the five now, the five senses that humans kind of have in common with plants, among others, but the, the well-known ones. But they also, plants also respond to gravity. Plants can generally sense gravity. They will, shoots will always grow upward and they will, uh, roots will always go downward. And I'm going to play here an invisible video uh, for you, but it's going to become visible once I kind of get my person in the right place. There we go. Uh, Always grow the right way. How does a seed know which direction is right? From where does a small seed get all this intelligence? In this question, we dream scientists for a long time. Suppose you have a seedling in a pot and you turn it upside down. Then the stem will take a U turn and start growing in the upward direction against the gravity. So the stems always grow in a direction opposite to gravity, and roots always grow in the direction of gravity. In short, Plants can sense gravity. So, uh, you know, I guess it's kind of self evident there. Other plant senses, right? Uh, humidity. Plants are able to sense humidity. Uh, they can sense water, uh, not surprising. Uh, it's essential for their uh, well being. Uh, they can uh, <clears throat> uh, sense oxygen. But what really is kind of fascinating is they can do very sophisticated analysis of nutrients in the soil. And uh, there's a little example we'll come to in a moment or two. 
uh, this capability of being able to analyze nutrients, right? Uh, so, you know, you really do get the evidence. It's one intelligence. It's just in different body shapes. In that case, the body is a plant, or the body is an animal, or the body is a human being. Uh, but you see all these same capabilities as others uh, demonstrate. So plants uh, have self-defense mechanisms. So they actually, uh, certain uh, plants, the acacia tree, uh, which is found in some parts of the world, produces tannins when being grazed by animals and uh, making themselves unappealing. And what's interesting, and is uh, actually you find on a YouTube video, a fairly long, you know, it's like a one hour show, uh, an example of where it's in South Africa, as I recall, uh, in one of the preserves, uh, nature preserves, uh, they found a lot of dead, I'm going to say a type of antelope. And they just couldn't understand why these antelopes, some of them were being found dead. And when they were doing autopsies on them, they saw they had these very elevated levels of tannins in their blood. And what they found is that when there are just too many antelope overgrazing, in effect, for if you're the, if you're the acacia tree, it's too many, it's overgrazing in their, from their vantage point, they actually crank up this higher level of tannins that they produce, which then kill off some of the, 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 the uh, antelope who are, are grazing them. So an interesting balance in nature uh, using chemicals. But what's also, here's the next one is really interesting. And this is where a uh, type of uh, uh, corn plant that emits a chemical to attract wasps to eat the caterpillars. So you got a caterpillar eating the leaf, they put out a chemical, attracts wasps to come and do kind of the, you know, it's a kind of 911 uh, version, but uh, hopefully a better mediated uh, than sometimes it happens. So anyway, isn't that like, hey, man, let me get somebody else to come in here and take care of these, 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 you know, I can't go on a whistle. Uh, it must be, if you're the caterpillar, think about it, right? I mean, if, you know, if they could perceive it more broadly as they may, uh, you know, all of a sudden, boom, they're bringing in, you know, the, uh, actually the hornets, you know, the F-22 hornets uh, to attack them. But anyway, uh, plants communicate with one another. Uh, they use chemical signaling between plants to do this. Uh, so there's just tons of evidence on this. Uh, it could be that there's uh, some sort of fungus or there's uh, some sort of insect uh, that's eating over in one part where they will uh, communicate within the plant, but they will also communicate it between plants. So, uh, uh, so within the plant, it could be a leaf is being attacked over here. The whole plant will respond, right? Because that'll be communicated through other leaves on the plant to, okay, let's start to produce this chemical because we're being attacked by caterpillars or whatever the insect or boll weevil, or whatever the thing may be. But they also send out signals uh, that communicate to other plants very much like uh, we see animals do, right? When they see a predator where they begin to send out signals that uh, other animals also respond to. Uh, plants communicate at the root level. And this is kind of really where most of it goes. There's a lot of chemical signaling kind of above the root level, but there's a ton of it that happens at the root level. And as you can see from this slide here, some scientists have described these, these enormous fungal connections, which should really be acres and acres of connections underground as the wood wide web. Uh, so, and as you may know, uh, some of the largest living organisms on the earth are funguses. You know, they just want gigantic molds, you know, uh, uh, organisms like acres of one organism that was all communicating without a brain, without a central, like, oh, no, so, which kind of, uh, again, uh, goes against what a lot of scientists kind of are used to thinking about is the only way that a thing can manifest intelligence, you know, but that's the myopia very often of a science, materialistic science. So, okay, plants share resources. So plants are, you know, good neighbors. Uh, they will share water and nutrients with others through a fungal network, right? So that's kind of happening underground, particularly when it comes to the nutrients. Uh, large trees will share resources with smaller ones until smaller ones are able to reach uh, sunlight. So you imagine, you know, in a large forest, right? There's the canopy that basically blocks off, you know, why is it cool in the forest? Because the trees are blocking the light. Right, that's how we can go. Oh, it's nice and cool in here. But if you're a plant, you need that that energy from the sun, right, for photosynthesis to grow. That's kind of how you create uh, the energy and the food that you need. Uh, so uh, large trees, very often, will, who are shading smaller trees, will provide it through uh, the root systems 
uh, nutrients to, to uh, smaller trees until they're able to kind of reach up. And some of it can be actually interspecies as well, which is interesting. There's also this interesting thing about, and this is an example, the, the kind of uh, interspecies. Trees that stay green year round share nutrients with trees that lose their leaves in the winter, helping them through the season. Because basically when you lose your leaves, right, you can't do the photosynthesis if you're a tree, right? So those who are evergreens, uh, uh, they've, you know, evidence that uh, I, I don't have, it says that every evergreen in every situation, every tree, but it's been demonstrated that trees do share nutrients uh, uh, during the winter season with other trees. Uh, you know, these are areas of, of relatively new exploration uh, because the science is so radical to what, you know, materialist scientists traditionally have thought. Uh, plants have memory, which uh, we were talking about before. So their uh, plant defenses are primed by past exposure to pest. Uh, so again, if you know they've been attacked by a, you know a corn beetle or whatever it is, uh, they will as soon as the attack starts again, even you know not using the audio recording of another attack, plants that have had past experience will mount their defenses much more immediately than naive plants who have never been attacked by the particular uh, type of parasite or, you know, or, or, or things that's gonna uh, hurt the plant. Venus, tries, flies, uh, Venus flytrap uh, plants are quite interesting because uh, really they respond to two contacts within 20 seconds. So there are three little sensors within those, the plant, there's two on the bottom, one on the top, and two of them have to be touched within 20 seconds. So if, if the bug goes and only touches one, waits 25 seconds to touch another one, it's fine. But if the two touches happen within 20 seconds, so they've got, clearly they have a memory and a sense of uh, time even. So uh, the mimosa plants also show what they call habituation. So uh, experiments, and this is you know, well-documented that they've done, uh, if they're, uh, you can basically drop a plant from about uh, six or seven inches uh, and the mimosa tree uh, plant will not close its leaf after a certain point and realize there's actually no danger. So they continue to drop it, and that memory can be retained for several weeks, but to show that it hasn't lost the capability, if you shake the plant instead, you will get the closing action. So uh, in that way, uh, they have habituation. They realize it's not a danger, just being dropped from six or seven uh, inches, but uh, you know, uh, if, if something different, they would react differently. Uh, it's believed that they close the leaves to scare away insects. Not a lot is known. I was giving you the example of the corn plants respond to the sound of pillars eating. So I'm going to show you plants making choices here. And this is really some uh, kind of uh, home video, again, from a gentleman on the, on the internet. So there's uh, an example. Uh, we can look at another one. <clears throat> so that I guess, again, looking at the appropriate object, but let's look at another one. So this here is looking at this uh, thing in the middle, a little tiny white kind of thing, a uh, sprout there of sorts in the middle. It has two options of where to go and uh, to attach to. The uh, plant on the left of the screen is something that uh, is a tomato plant. And this particular one in the middle uh, finds that it can much easier, more easily kind of take resources from a tomato plant than some other types of plants. So here it's kind of this little sprout is presented with two options. And what you'll see, uh, if I can get my cursor here, of how this goes. Now again, this is time lapse photography, obviously. So uh, that's, again, uh, using a type of clearly judgment, deciding on what to act so it's able to sense the two things in this environment, recognizes one versus the other. And remember, you, you, 
remember, it's all vibration, right? So it does. You don't have to have eyes to perceive something, right? So it just for us, eyes give us. You know, we call them eyes because they're perceiving certain frequencies of vibration, right? And we call them eyes. Uh, but everything's given with vibrations, and those vibrations clearly are unique to every uh, individual organism. And clearly, plants are able to perceive these vibrations, and in this case, recognize that they're a better food source and respond to appropriately uh, att attempt to attach yourself to it. So, uh, so plants reason, this is really one of these things that is uh, uh, really kind of dumbfounded, you know, very traditional scientists, but all this again, if you go to something called sciencedaily.com, you can just Google or, you know, put in the search thing plant intelligence and you'll just find many uh, piece of, uh, you know, science, uh, published science research on this. So they respond to uh, to competition for light, right? So plant will look at alternative ways of getting to it. Uh, in terms of it's in a dense area, uh, they will kind of uh, you know grow one way so they can get out of the shade. Uh, those things of that nature. Uh, they also uh, will look at uh, you know, as putting a you know shade tolerance depending on what they can you know how much light do they need. So they'll begin to reason. But what's most interesting here. Uh, is they will direct root growth around obstacles. So if they see an obstacle, there's a rock or something, they will direct their root growth around it to get to what they're, they're seeking, whether it's water, whatever the case may be. Uh, this one is one of the more interesting things. This is actually a recent uh, pu uh, scientific publication on this is that, and actually this was the title kind of given by sciencedaily.com, Plants Gamble. Uh, so they will kind of look at what's the, probabilities of getting a certain re, uh, nutrient. So if, if they're, because for plants growing out their roots and their leaves, growing is energy. That's how they consume energy. They're going to make use of energy. So they have to be very careful and judicious how they do that. If they need a certain nutrient level, let's say it needs to be, you know, 0.85% nitrogen uh, in the soil. Uh, if they find that, they actually will grow out uh, into a very stable concentration. Uh, but if it turns out that it's below that level, let's say it's only a 0.65, but there's another source where it seems to be increasing density, even though it's below the 0.65, the plant will grow out where it's an increasing a kind of vector or direction of an increased uh, uh, intensity or uh, concentration of the nutrient. So it's actually kind of gambling a little bit. It says, well, okay, there's not enough here. Let me try this over here. That's a very big investment for a plant because of deciding on how to grow. Uh, you know, when we look at also plants making complex decisions, uh, uh, this is a very complicated one. So I'm not going to take you kind of deep into it, but it's basically how it looks at uh, in the barberry plant when there's, there's usually two seeds apparently in the fruit. And if one has been infested by a parasite, how the plant decides to not nurture one of those two seeds inside of itself because that's already infected and saying, let me sh take my resources and put it on the good one. I'll starve the bad when it's infected and I'll put the resources on the good one. But if there's only one seed, it will actually continue to, to furnish that seed uh, uh, with, with nutrients attempting to, uh, to have the seed uh, uh, survive. So they make kind of plant uh, complex decisions in that sense. Uh, plants also respond to, and this is quite complex, uh, Controversial also it looks like to Pavlovian conditioning. So if you kind of say to plants, look, uh, there's light over here and you kind of blow a fan uh, over there and you keep doing that light fan together, soon plants will go toward where they feel the fan. When given a choice, say, ah, light's must gonna be over there. I'm gonna go over there to do that. Uh, plants recognize self versus non-self. So they avoid wrapping around their own stalk. They kind of do not compete uh, with their own roots. They might compete with others. And I'm gonna give you a look at that as well. Uh, so let's see if this works. So this is the same backyard researcher. Around 
Now, we may think that kind of brings it to a genius level of plants, but apparently it's just like they are fairly, that's just intelligence that they have with, oh my God, you're so smart. This plant is so smart. Well, no, it's just no self from non-self, right? We don't consider that to be genius. And humans, we go, oh my God. Uh, you know, so if we just have to begin to attribute and recognize that plants also have the same intelligence that we have, right? Different form, uh, but uh, so here's the one now, we're gonna close with this thing here. And this really uh, became popular way back in the day. Uh, there was a book called The Secret Life of Plants and it was extremely controversial back then. It's in the seventies. And it, the people that what purported was reported in the book was that plants in effect could read intentions at least read the intentions of humans, right? Know about other things, but could read intentions, right? And some telepathic way and respond to it. And uh, it really, because a guy who kind of stumbled across this happened to be uh, uh, formerly been an expert with the FBI in using uh, basically a polygraph machine. And part of polygraph machines work off of moisture detecting. You know, if you're sweating, they go, oh, there's a reason why you're sweating. So they'd be able to tell electroconductus in the skin because if the skin is more moist, uh, it'll construct electricity better than if it was dry, right? So he happened to, uh, in his lab, happened to have a plant and he wanted to go and measure, when he watered his plant, how fast the water traveled from the soil up to the uppermost parts of the plant. He was just doing his experiment to see how fast the water traveled. And he then put uh, sensors uh, there uh, in the ground, in, in the soil of the plant pot, as well as attach something to the leaf to find out how fast it traveled. And he had a weird discovery, which is a seem that this plant uh, recognized some intention as part. Uh, so uh, this became very, you know, uh, he pursued it further, it was quite controversial. So this here, by the way, uh, and it led to, let's just say, people being on TV talk shows and all this. So this little clip here, it's about two minutes and change, we're gonna close with this. Uh, comes from the TV show Mythbusters. So it's like a cable show, Mythbusters, and they, you know their whole business is trying to, you know, get rid of myths of people that maybe aren't true, right? I mean, you know, a lot of things aren't true that people think are true, and so they decided, okay, they were going to go check this out, and, and I just let's let's watch this. So uh, I am put up here uh, a few things related readings that uh, you can get uh, look into. 
uh, as you can see there, by the way, uh, does seem, I think as many people recognize, plants sense emotions and states and react to you know, kind and loving thoughts, and apparently uh, also react to dangerous thoughts. I think thoughts that suggest some sort of danger to them. Uh, it's quite interesting. Uh, and those people who did that, as you can see, you know, kind of skeptics now, you know, all the wording on the bottom, I think was from Poland or something, but anyway, fortunately it was in English. So you can look at some related readings. Uh, there's lots more. Uh, there's constantly, I'd say, books and research being done. There's a few very uh, primary researches on this. Uh, so I uh, recommend it to you if you, you find it uh, the further interest, lots, lots you can read on this. So I'm gonna get out of screen sharing here. Your screen sharing, stop share. Sunny and share, okay. There we go. Uh, so anyway, I hope you found it uh, interesting. Uh, and uh, you know, there's some other avenues for you to pursue if you, if you so desire. So thank you very much. Uh, thank you, SA, as well for helping me through that.